Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. He's backstage now, shooting a rod of semen into his own mouth. Please welcome Richard Herring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to be here. You're much better than last week's audience. Oh, you are. Hold on. Uh, so, uh, welcome to Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast, or as all the cool kids are calling it, Rahulas de Pur. Thank you. It's been quite a week, hasn't it, Dave? It's been all right. So, uh, Dave at the front there, you'll have missed that if you're at home. He's a good lad. Uh, um, the the honours list came out, which was very exciting, and I was delighted to see... Um, this really moved me, actually, because we get a lot of honours and some people don't think are worth it, but it was great to see that Prince Charles has become a Field Marshal, Admiral of the Fleet, and a Marshal of the Royal Air Force. It's incredible. Must be chuffed to bits, mustn't he, on his uh, amazing triumvirate of success he's had. Most servicemen and women don't, would have been happy to get one of those, but to get all, get all three, it's amazing. he must be over the moon. I know some cynical people might say, you know, You've got a Republican agenda that he only got those accolades through nepotism, but that, that is ridiculous, frankly. His, his mum must have been aware that people would think that. She would have thought really hard about whether she was going to give them to. Cause, and she did it anyway, which proves that he definitely earned it for all his brilliant army, navy, and flying around stuff. Must be punch in the air when he got the news, sir. Uh, and some people, I bet still, even now, I bet some of you are cynically saying that he didn't deserve it. But I'll give you this piece of information. I think you'll realise how foolish you are. His dad, Prince Philip, also has all three of those things. <laughs> so it's clearly a genetic trait. They're just... I'm amazed we've got an army at all. Why don't we just have the royal family? They're so good at being in the army and stuff, aren't they? they, they they're like the Avengers, you know, the new ones. They, they're the five of them, probably not Prince Edward, uh, to be fair, but Andrew would be in when he's all right. Charles, Princess Anne, on a horse. <laughs> Could have a crack. It's amazing. Uh, and the, you know, the government are cutting in the budget anyway, so it's, uh, let's, let's do it all in one go. And I just hope that Prince Charles doesn't listen to any of those naysayers who didn't think he deserved to get the highest possible position in all three branches of the military. I'd hate him to be thinking, hold on, I'm a 63-year-old man having special awards pinned onto me by my mum (laughs) whilst dressed up in fancy dress. I should feel nothing but shame for going along with this pantomime. Uh, At least it wouldn't be quite as bad if I'd done anything at all to deserve it. I hope he isn't thinking that, and I hope this... People, because that would be wrong. I hope he's thinking, yay, look at me with all my medals and stuff. I'm brilliant. Uh, ask my mum. My, if you don't believe me, ask my mum. She'll tell you how good I am. She won't let me be king, though. No, that's a shame. She thinks she's trying to distract me with all this meaningless shit. I don't know. Uh, but Armando, you know, she also got an OBE. He's next week's guest, OBE. I didn't even know he was related to the royal family, to be honest. So, I mean, it's... Well done to him. We'll talk to him about whether satirists should accept... Uh, baubles from the Queen next week. That'll be interesting. <laughs> be interesting. I reckon I'm better than Alistair Campbell. I reckon I can give him a run for his money. So, uh, anyway, uh, we're going to cr- crack straight on. We've got an amazing guest. Uh, I haven't appeared on stage with him. Oh, look, he's just... He's, there he's, that's professional. He's grabbed the curtain ready to... <laughs> he's ready to open it. And he, no one can see that. That is... He knows that as a professional, no one can see he's there. Um, so, uh, he, uh, he usually works in TV, but he's, been, he's come into the future. I'm giving him a chance with his crack on the internet, and hopefully this will work out for him. I can help him out. Will you please welcome the star of B- Sky B's Up Your News, it's Stuart Lee. <laughs> Stuart Lee, ladies and gentlemen. Stuart Graham Lee. <laughs> How you doing, Stu? Thank you for having this, me. It's all right. This is the internet this goes out on. Oh, yeah. Although it is being filmed. There are people at home. You'll see cameramen walking around so you can talk. You can, just to make you feel at home, because we know you like to work in a visual medium. Good. You are able to look at the camera. So you look down and say hello to the people at home there mm-hmm. who have bought, <laughs> have bought Fist of Fun Series 2. They've, bought it, they've got it now. There's oh, no, we don't, so it's yeah, all right. This is an, this this is an extra, extra for that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, so let, for the first thing, I want, what do you think about Armando Unici getting an OBE? Are you delighted you're... Well, you know, I mean, uh, I think it'll be weird for him I don't, I, because uh, obviously, you know, he's, he's supposed to be... 
people will go, yeah, that's all well for you to say that, but you're an OBE, won't they? And yeah. I, like, you'll have to find a way of negotiating it. On the other hand, it could be hilarious to have, <laughs> you know. The, but, but it's strange, that sort of generation of people, like, Charlie Brooker's gone to Sky, Armando's got an OBE. It is weird how this, they're sort of being assimilated by the establishment, and there doesn't seem to be anyone in their 20s that's an equivalent sort of figure coming mm-hmm. through. You've got a BAFTA? And yeah, no, yeah. Two, two British comedy awards. Although, to be fair, I, I was cut out of the television broadcast <laughs> for making an, a, a confusing, an acceptance speech that confused Kate Thornton. <laughs> it's well worth saying, I looked at it, they talked to Kate Thornton, who I don't think is used... <laughs> you say, she said something like, um, oh, it must be great, there must be people out there who, who didn't give you jobs in the past, are you glad about that? And then you, you compare it to the weather, which is kind of... Yeah, so you know, we can't... Make a philosoph- philosoph- well, I said that the commissioning procedure in television is so random that to think that it's for or against you is the same as thinking that if the sun comes out, weather has kind of favoured you, has an opinion <laughs> about you, or if it rains on you, weather dislikes you in some way... So I, I said, I don't really feel you can ascribe any motive or moral worth to it. <laughs> and as I was saying this, I thought, ah, oh, this isn't going to make the television. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't do it. I, I just felt like when you sit there in the ceremony, and we've both been to lots where we've, we've been to, them, we very rarely get to pick anything up. You, you, you sit and watch, but you think, what are you talking about? You know, like, <laughs> it's like when people thank, uh, thank God as if... God would have an interest in Halle Berry's uh, role in a James Bond film. You know, like, so you have to be a bit careful of thinking that it means anything. And at the same time, you have to appear to not be ungrateful, even yeah. though, the, the, you know, you look at the... Who, I don't even know where they come from. Or well, how you're it's up decided. there with uh, Keith Lemon, got one, didn't he? So you, <laughs> yeah, you, you're up there. <laughs> yeah. You're up there now with him, so that's the... Well, you know, that's, how you can that's judge the other it. thing. It's always baffling, the whole thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be... But, you know, you also can't... You can't start behaving with a, a sense of entitlement because, you, you know, as well as I, it's entirely random and comes and goes and doesn't mean anything. You know? Yeah, but, then you, but when you get one, then it does mean something because then it, the BBC have to give you another series. Well, that's, well, why, well that's luckily, <laughs> they'd, they'd done that. Otherwise, they're, they're, it would have been really awkward for everyone, I think. But <laughs> it's funny winning something through the BBC. We, I mean, you know, because we, we, now um, we, we, were on a, 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 we had to go on a table afterwards for dinner, uh, and uh, it was me and uh, Jennifer Saunders, who I think had won something as well. But because it's the BBC and they're under such scrutiny from the tabloid press and the right and, and uh, the government and whatever, they can't be seen to be uh, splashing cash around. So we, we couldn't really have any champagne. And all around <laughs> us there were tables of uh, production company, of independent broadcasters out of their minds. <laughs> and uh, on, and the, the, the guy from BBC Comedy had to work out if he'd got enough cash in his own wallet <laughs> to be able to get a drink because they're not allowed to put any of your money through the system to wine and dine the stars, which is, of course, absolutely correct, but quite an odd situation to be in when all around you, people from poor quality Sky television programmes uh, out of their mind on a cocktail of champagne and drugs paid for by the advertiser. <laughs> hey, you didn't hear that here. <laughs> this goes, it does go out into does it the go out? Yeah, It goes out into the I world. I thought a podcast <laughs> just you listen to it at home. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a know, vast, you... ongoing vanity project. <laughs> <laughs> I just it's like such to... a thin line between I'll... broadcasting. I just and... like to record every single thing I do in my life, <laughs> no, no, well, and then I record bit... myself listening to it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Lego. That was that was well, me. You, know, listening you say that to... as a joke, but that is a bit what the world is like now, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, everything's so. We were talking about this backstage, actually, and because it was a conversation between us that was private backstage, I assume people like you will be interested in it. <laughs> but we were um, <laughs> just saying how odd it is that now everything is... If you, if you, if you do a gig and you're trying to work out new stuff, you're kind of worried in, in a little club somewhere that it'll be filmed and it'll be out there and you, you can't kind of control it. But, then it. but because everything now is filmed or recorded or put on the internet, and yet there's all sorts of stuff we did together and, and, and on our own in the 90s that you, in retrospect, wish somebody had been interested enough to record because <laughs> you've got no record of but it. But even now. like with, uh, with uh, Talking Cock, uh, which I'm doing this year, and Christ and Mike, which I did a couple of years ago, I had no record of them at all apart from 
to <laughs> two people yeah. had, had taken them illegally in the audience and put them on the internet. So I was quite glad that they did yeah. that. But uh, I would have had no record of that. People's them, memories of them were much better than the actual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But imagine you want a BAFTA on your own. Imagine if you'd had like a funny bloke coming in doing some actual jokes in the show. <laughs> how many. <laughs> Imagine how many BAFTAs you would have won. It's amazing you've done yeah. that on your own. It's like, no, I know, but, it's like well. Sid Little winning <laughs> BAFTAs. <laughs> just, just doing it. And Eddie Large isn't even coming on. No, He's I just staying so. backstage. No, don't think I've not thought about that. I mean, you, you know, um, when, I, when I got the British Comedy Award, I, I made a big... I listed all the people that I felt I'd ever worked with who'd been, you know, hugely helpful. And I did mention you, but that oh. was cut out of the television broadcast. <laughs> that was about as interesting to them as talking about the weather on the <laughs> BAFTAs. Yeah. So I want to get this over with quickly because I want to be able to link to this podcast to all the people who tweet me and say, why isn't Stuart Lee on Twitter? So if I put this early in the podcast... Right. You don't, it's not just limited to 140 characters, Stu. I can put a link and they can listen to 90 minutes of a man yeah, talking. Well, but then you can explain why you're not going to go on Twitter and then well, I don't have to Firstly, reply. it's because Rich has just explained something about it that I didn't know before. <laughs> so I didn't know that. Uh, OK, I think it's part, when, uh, when I first heard about what Twitter was, about six months ago, I, um, <laughs> I, I put my name into the search engine... And I don't really mind about people slagging me off and saying they hate me and they wish I'd die of Crohn's disease and things like that. <laughs> but I, I honestly don't. I really, really don't, honestly, even, even though there are people in my family that have had issues with that illness. I don't really mind that. But I do... It was a lot of stuff of people saying where I was with my children and what I had been doing with them and how I was in a pizza restaurant with my son and he did this or whatever... And I thought, God, that's re- really freaked me out, to be honest. I felt that was quite easy. And I know you, you're telling me you only find out about that if you do a search yeah. on your So network. if I saw I you in the street that. and then I went into a restaurant and went, Stuart Lee's out there, more people would hear about yeah, yeah, it yeah, than yeah, on the Well, I didn't really understand that. that but that, <laughs> I found that a bit disturbing. The, the second thing is, I, I, I sort of think that, you, you ha- that everyone's excited about it because it, you get instant feedback from an audience about what you're doing. And um, I sort of think you have to think that what you're doing is worth it, irrespective of what the audience actually think. <laughs> and um, so I think you have to press on regardless and not be swayed by public opinion. <laughs> I think but that's, but that's, not, that's not even... I think the main thing about it... Well, it's, yeah. well, hey, People just pretend to be you, and so every now and then yeah. I, have to, I have to just go to people, they at me and you, me, and yeah. Stuart Lee one who isn't you, yeah. in, and I have to go, that isn't actually Stuart Lee, yeah. that's some idiot pretending. Why, if you're going to pretend to be anyone, why would you choose Stuart <laughs> You can choose anyone in the world. And you go, I'm going to be Stuart Lee. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, but it's, it's more about, you, you gather information, you can get... You know, I think what's quite yeah. interesting about it as well is you, you, if you follow a few people, you get to see the joke that everyone's making about a subject, and you realise yeah. what's, what's the obvious joke straight away. So if, you, if even in your head for a second you thought, oh, I might do that joke, you look at Twitter and go, 50 people have done that joke. Yeah. The annoying thing is you tweet something now and you're, 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 you, there's so many smart asses out there red trying to come in with a joke. You're, all, you're trying to self-edit yourself in order for there to yeah. be no way that they can make the joke well, that you'll know they'll make if you, well, don't, if you don't... Nothing is, I, be, I barely have time to do what I'm supposed to. You know, with, with, I, I kind of can't... can't I don't, I don't. The other thing is that increasingly in... Stand up. I feel I have to separate out who I am from what the stand up character would do. And irrespective of what I would do, I might possibly use Twitter if I had time, which I don't. But Stuart Lee, the comedian, would despise it. <laughs> uh, he, he would hate it and he would hate the idea that he had to communicate with people. So I have to not do it <laughs> because he wouldn't. You know, I know that sounds really Honestly, mad. Honestly, a but comedian with multiple personalities. <laughs> no. that is just that. But quite a lot pathetic. of things in my life now are like, I think, <laughs> that's one of the reasons I was happy to, when the BBC were talking about doing another series, well, they initially didn't want to, and then Sky did, and then the BBC did, and there were all sorts of discussions about whether you know, people would you go to Sky and whatever. In the end, it never came up because what the comedian Stuart Lee would do <laughs> is he would stay at the BBC where he had been consistently badly treated and um, <laughs> marginalised and let down uh, and he would stay at a place where all the other talent was leaving for Sky and he would sort of do that out of a sense of perversity, irrespectful. so I sort of thought, yeah, he would, he would sort of stay there and like 
complain while the ship was sort of sinking. And I, so in the end, the decision sort of made itself because it, what I would do sort of doesn't really matter. You have to think what he would do. Right. You look at me like a man, but yeah. he, you know, he would... He would he, he was never stayed. like this when I worked with him. He I know. Was, he, there was only one well, of them. Well, that's because in a double act, you have the other person to create a dialogue with. But when you're on your own, you have to develop essentially a split personality. That comes. So I sort of thought, yeah, he would, he would stay there because he would, he would like the feeling of being sort of a marginalised figure when everyone else had gone somewhere else for higher rates. You know, he would kind of do that partly, and he would sort of do it out of a sort of weird sense of like superiority and so I don't really know you know it just felt like the right thing to do for him he right. has to kind of stay there to, you look at me like you know it's true though it's like he's, a, he's not he's slightly different he's largely the same I as play me. snooker against myself in my I'm basement not, and I talk yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and commentate on it yeah. I can't there's no, nothing no, without, no, there's not. about five or six of me in that so <laughs> yeah so it's sort of sometimes you have to Sometimes you have to make decisions based on not what you would do, but what this person that yeah. you sort of are, but would do, who isn't you. Does that make sense? It does make yeah, sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that anyone can make a living doing yeah. what we do. Uh, well, what you do, I, can't, I, don't, I don't make a living. But, um, I'll ask this question so I don't forget. Uh, okay, but then, about, then about Twitter, but just go about Twitter, right? How do you do it? Because, because there's all sorts of yous, aren't there? Yes. You're right. So do you? So there's the the sort of solo show where there's the thoughtful bits and the monologues. There's the lively, combative, comparing thing. There's columnist. There's blogger, and then there's uh, you know the the Twitter thing. And they're all slightly different. Yeah. How do you synthesise those into? How, how do you give an account of yourself on Twitter as a particular person when you occupy all these different spaces? Just do whatever I think. Come over. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, it's right in, and then sometimes it's too long, and I change an and to an ampersand. <laughs> right. <then. laughs> Good. <laughs> but uh, you know, but I, that's what. But what I like about comedy is like being able to do loads of different things yeah. where you have really kind of uh, within, within comedy anyway because yeah, you do yeah, lots yeah. of things outside of comedy but you've really kind of stuck which we, I think is yeah. probably why I'm not very successful <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. because you know I'll do a different when I do yeah, a stand-up yeah. show you never know the next year whether the stand-up show will be yeah. the same even the same kind of persona on stage yeah. exactly well they're, they're, they're increasingly it gels I mean you've been working I guess on the same uh, stand-up character for a lot longer than I have because I didn't do stand-up for yeah, years well. in between and you kind of carried on to, or while we were doing the double act you yeah, were still yeah. doing your, your solo stuff. Yeah, although I, although I only feel it started to gel about nine years ago, really. Yeah. But, but, yeah, well, I mean, I've partly done that because having kids, you, you have to make decisions about... You have such... Your time suddenly disappears. So you have to think, are things financially worthwhile or are they artistically worthwhile? And I do those things. Weirdly, tonight is neither of those. <laughs> and, yet, and yet I've come... All the same. But, you know, you, you have to make those decisions and you, you kind of can't afford... I mean, I look, at, I look at the variety of stuff that you can do and I think, oh, I, I couldn't... Like, Rich had lots of ideas at the weekend about, you know, maybe we should have tried to write some new material in the vein of Lee and Herring today. And it's just kind of... The problem is today, I had to draw a big pirate ship with stencils... <laughs> And then, you know, it's sort of like you kind of... So it, it's just sort of difficult to do something like You kind of... Your time disappears. So, and also, having been in a kind of... Uh, what well, with a stand-up, I, I kept trying to get away from it and do other things and take things from my stand-up into those things, like bits of theatre or writing fiction or whatever, or things that were like one-man kind of performance arty kind of shows. And in the end, they... All the things that I did in them, I realised I was better at doing stand-up, really. And I kind of had to consolidate in that. You know, I couldn't really afford to keep losing the money. No, but, but I actually, I don't remember, I don't know if I said to you, but when you were doing, um, when you, you went the period where you stopped doing stand-up, which I thought was a shame when I t- said you should carry on doing stand-up, I think it was, probably, it was very I good for you. I remember where that was. It was very good for you to have the time off, but I also thought... You were writing these things for the Sunday Times. You know, you were doing stuff yeah. for journalism. And you were doing different. Th- you were doing all these different things. Yeah. And I was just sort of saying, you know, you've, if I was just thinking, you know, if you could just 
go back and do stand up. So it's, it is. Yeah, but but you know, it's all down that, to me. but no, at that <laughs> point, you know, we were, that that was about two thousand, and like, I, 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 you know, I'd gone to Edinburgh again with a new show. I remember that year, and I'd come out eight thousand pounds in debt, and some they tried somebody had tried to organise a tour where it was me and Andy Zaltzman supporting me. And none of the venues had told Andy Z- had been told Andy Zoltzman was coming, so I travelled around the country for about two weeks with Andy Zoltzman as this kind of weird f- chaperone figure who <laughs> had no gigs but had to go to Glasgow and stuff like that. And it was just kind of by the end of it, I just thought I can't do this anymore, you yeah. know. And so I, and I stopped. And I, during that period, my during that period, which is also the period of doing. Um, Jerry Springer the Opera, which also famously didn't really turn a profit. My main source of income was I did two record reviews a week for a Murdoch newspaper, <laughs> uh, who's my default arts patron, and I won't have a word said against it. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and the only reason I'm here today is because of his generosity. He's not aware that he commissioned me, but um, he's a huge fan of the gay San Francisco <laughs> punk bands I wrote about. But... Um, you know, it was that, that. It was just the fact that you couldn't, you couldn't keep. I felt I couldn't keep losing money. You know, no. and, and and I thought there must be another way of using those skills. As it turned out, there wasn't. And then, you know, <laughs> then I went back to doing stand up. And also, you know. by I think a, by doing Jerry Springer, which was an amazing show, but it did it did mean that. Um, all those kind of, all those kind of, it was, it was really important the progression of your then of your renaissance, I think, and yeah, that it right. meant that you were suddenly taken really yeah. seriously by Absolutely. all those kind of cr- the critical kind of well, artsy. I, you know, uh, your, your old management, I was with Avalon. You know, they rightly or wrongly, their thing is they sort of try and package all their acts together in 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 projects to get as many people through the door as they can. And Richard Thomas, the composer, stroke comedian, had. You know, Joey Spring of the Opera was well underway when John Thoday suggested that I helped out with sort of writing a story and getting it on its feet. And so, by association with it, the, the same kind of critics that would have seen my stand up in the 90s and said, he doesn't know what he's doing, it, it, it's rubbish, uh, because they'd now given something else I'd worked on, good reviews, they had to give it the benefit of the doubt and go, this long, boring bit where there are no laughs. Presumably, there's some reason for this, <laughs> and um, and it absolutely was. It was like basically being associated with an Olivier Award-winning thing meant that you got reviewed by a different kind of person. I actually, I don't. And when people say to me, "How did you get to do this kind of stand-up at the level you're doing it?" There's loads of reasons, and they're not to do with merit. They're to do with luck. You know. But, you know, I think every, things do boil down to luck. I mean, I think that there is some. Merit. Oh God, did I say that? There is some merit involved in it, but uh, <laughs> but it did also give you the impetus to come back and the show you did when you came back was was a result of all the well, Christian uh, protests well, as well. So that the, show... Well, the second one was, but I mean, yeah. partly why I came back to doing stand as well from Jason the Opera was you could be in a thing round the corner here um, at the Cambridge Theatre. I mean, we were there for two years in a 500-seater and the expense of running it and the legal costs of fighting a different people that tried to close it down meant that I'd have been better off doing stand-up in 30-seater pubs for four years, you know. I mean, it, it kind of people don't really believe that, but, um, again, you were kind of... I was even more in debt by the end of it. I used all my savings up on being able to carry on working on the opera because the assumption was at some point it would pay off. And um, it wasn't entirely the fault of the producers because no-one could have foreseen 65,000 people trying to close it down for no good reason. <laughs> um, but it did mean... That I thought, well, I need to make a living. What can I actually do? Yeah. I can do stand-up. And also, having worked with Richard Thomas, I sort of thought he, he'd taken music theatre and he'd done what he wanted with it, which was for it to not be shit. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you could do that with stand-up in some way. <laughs> so it was, you know, I thought he, 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 can, he, he has lots of wise epigrams, Richard Thomas. Like, you know, if you don't try and fit in, you haven't got to compete. That was one of them. I don't know what it means, but um, <laughs> I said that a lot to myself, and it was all right. No, got, it was kind of, you were forced back on it, because there was yeah. no... I mean, I was like th- I was in my late 30s, and nothing had worked out. I thought, well, I'll try no. again at stand-up. And so... And I didn't have any hopes for it, really, or expectations, and that, and that added to... But, you know, I mean, you do... You do 
you do get back to what you wanted. I mean, you, th- you must have found that you've been through so many things, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, because I, I didn't, I didn't like stand up when I first did it, and no. we both did it for. I did it for a couple of years when we first came to London. I couldn't find what what I wanted to do with it, and I was trying to please other people and not necessarily mm. myself, and. Uh, just got confused and I didn't like it and decided I couldn't do stuff on my own but what, the, the big thing for me as well was coming back to stand up and then exactly the same thing just going well I'm going to do whatever I want and I did a yeah. year of touring around clubs where no, really people didn't know who I was and doing yeah. 20 minute routines about buying yoghurt in a yeah. Uh, and it was interesting because, you know, you got different kind of reactions and you'd, you'd driven 300 miles to do a gig or 150 miles to do a gig <laughs> and had to drive straight home again that night because there wasn't enough money to, for a yeah. hotel. And so, you know, you just, you, you learn by doing it. And so I think the autonomy of stand-up is, is yeah. I can see appealing to you because you like to just be in control of everything you do. I do, yeah, I know, that's true. Yeah. No, no I mean, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's an accurate criticism of me. Is that, is well, it's not I, necessarily a criticism. Well, no, it's true. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't cope with... Um, the surrendering of, of authority about things that I've done, and I think you 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 make your bed, you know, and you lie in it. And I and I'd rather something just failed and it was entirely my fault than I, I'd had to, you know, I can't I can't cope, and it's probably some kind of mental illness, but yeah. I, you know, can't do it. So you know what you want? No, the moon. Oh, and the no. <laughs> I thought they were getting a bit. I thought I'd throw them a bone. They were getting a bit bored. Yeah, I know. They've, they've paid twelve pound fifty to be here, and they want to hear. Good. They want to hear all the catchphrases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll get them all out. I had to had to go on Twitter to ask Remember people to remind me of what we used to say. Yeah, that's funny actually, because like, not not to um, devalue anyone's nostalgic relationship with things we did <laughs> twenty years ago, but sometimes. I'll be walking along the street and someone drives by and shouts something at me. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck is. <laughs> like some f- phrase from something. <laughs> Which was only on once. I just remember Fist of Fun was never repeated anymore. No, and also, really... like, there's loads of stuff from the radio. And sometimes yeah, things, yeah. things will come from the radio, should be in 1993. Yeah. Well, I like, like, too. And, you go, and they think you're being rude, but you can't remember. <laughs> When we did when we did the commentaries for the second series, which I understand this is going to be a, yes, an extra of, there were things that I have no memory whatsoever <laughs> of having written or performed or have gone to the place where they're filmed. Right? It's like a strange... I, I think that period, we did so much and we worked so hard. I mean, it sounds... I mean, I know there's people like... There's probably people listening to this who work in mines and stuff and they're going, well, you there don't aren't. really. We don't, but, we don't, um, we don't let but, them... No, you don't. Don't let them listen. <laughs> no. <laughs> but actually, I can't really... I can't... Just again, I was saying backstage, which I, got, I can't remember much about 1996 to about 1998. Sort of... <laughs> I know you were involved. I was there. <laughs> there was an early version of Rehypnol involved. That is... That is... <laughs> Uh, no, it is, it is weird. Well, I saw an episode of um, Time, Gentlemen, Please, which I wrote and you script edited yeah, yeah. Uh, the other day, or well, it was a couple of years ago on, on you know, satellite TV somewhere. I was thinking, I don't remember this one at all. I don't think I could have even have come down to the studio for this one. I must have been writing. And then I'm in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> I come in and go, I don't even remember, I don't remember that. Bit. Mm. So, you know, you are, when you are, we, you know, you're churning yeah. out, as we know, we were, we were writing shows, especially when we got to this morning, I suppose, we were yeah. writing the show mainly in the week, weren't we? And yeah. When we did Time, time Shannon, please, I was generally writing them in a week. But, um, well, actually, the thing about this one, which not you, is you were sort of, you had, you had to kind of turn up on a Sunday morning at about half past five yeah. to do all the, and it was like, um, being sort of jolted awake into this kind of strange dream-like situation where you were trying to remember things that you'd written in the week. And I mean, it's like a... It was, well, yeah, we got up at five, then we recorded it live, well, we did it yeah, live, 12.15, yeah, yeah. and then we'd be finished by one, and then we'd, we'd work really hard all week, and then we spent... what I, I can't believe we can remember this year, because yeah. we then went out to the back of the, the Riverside Hamster before there's a patio and drank vodka and Red Bull for eight hours. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, we just drank bot. We'd go across to the off license to buy the vodka because it was too expensive to get it from the bar, and so we literally bought. You know, we probably had drank drank a bottle of vodka each. Yeah. Day. Well, it's very tra- about- I mean, weird, traumatizing experience. Also, particularly in the second series, you had this feeling right from the start that you were working quite hard on getting it together and trying to come up with forty-five minutes of new material every week, which was about the news, which no one else had ever really done before or since, for good reason. We now realise, and. Um, and, but I also knew right from the beginning that it was going to be over. Yeah. You, we kind of knew a decision had been made um, at the top level that some kind of mistake had been made and why was this on? And you sort of knew that because every week you'd look out into the audience and there would be the sympathetic 
but ultimately crushed faces of various comedy uh, executives <laughs> from the BBC who had been told that the head of BBC Two was going to come with them that week and there was an empty seat next to them. <laughs> and you, know? you just kind of could just kind of feel it slipping away. So it was a really strange thing. It was like you were drinking you know, in the last chance saloon, as they say. Or, but then the other liberating thing about that was because we knew no one was interested in it, we were able to sort of do whatever we wanted because no one was even watching it or uh, <laughs> checking what was in it. Or, uh, and in fact, it used to go out on Sunday mornings and then live. And then I used to go in with the producer, Charlie Hansen, to do an edit on Thursdays to cut it down to 35 minutes when it went out on Friday nights. And I remember one morning, it was a Thursday, and we were in rehearsal, and we opened the paper, and the show was listed as going out that evening because there'd been some sport on, and they'd moved it. But no one had told us. <laughs> and so the edit hadn't been made. The programme didn't exist, because no one... they made that decision to move its transmission time without telling anyone even involved in the production. So the actual 35-minute edit, we had to kind of find somewhere really quickly and just stick it together with sellotape and glue and stuff and send it off. <laughs> now, that's an indication of the extent to which it was not cared about, that no one even told to tell us chose to tell us that it was supposed to be on and it wasn't made and, um... and I swore in it nearly every week while, they were sing- while we were singing <laughs> while we were singing the king song we'd go there's one king one king and then I'd go wang king wang king <laughs> or I'd go we'd go fa 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 king fa ha king fa ha king yeah. so no one spotted any of that so there's if, you, if, you, yeah, because if literally... that comes out on DVD you can spot that and right? very often people come up to you and you go oh I remember that thing you used to do on Sunday mornings how did you get away with it because no one cared about it. <laughs> there was no, no one was even interested enough in it to see what was in it. it was and no, but I think also the people who care about that stuff aren't watching it 12.15 on a Sunday because they kind of presume they're in, that's not, they don't have to kind yeah. of get their beak into that because there's not going to be some things about Jesus. Maybe, maybe they yeah. tuned in and saw it. Oh, it's just the thing about Jesus. We can yeah. turn off. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's sort of what you want. It's certainly with a second series I did of Comedy Vehicle, I don't quite know how it got recommissioned it was um, they moved it to like 11.15 and it was on a much lower budget and again I sort of felt much freer to do kind of better stuff because I thought no one was really interested in it and the problem (laughs) is now that's presumed to have done well it'll be moved back towards the daylight (laughs) which means it will inevitably be worse people will see it they'll (laughs) realise what it is it'll be taken off the air Uh, Right, let's clear up some things uh, that need to be cleared up. In 1987, I've spoken about this, we went to the Edinburgh Fringe. I've spoken on other podcasts. (laughs) And um, uh, it was a turbulent time. We were young men. Uh, I'd had sex once for 35 seconds with a lady. Uh, not sure you had at this no, stage. Um, no question that has, includes the phrase, we were young men. It's going to end well, <laughs> is it? Um, and uh, I was crying one night on the yeah. floor of Johnson Terrace because of some, someone had upset me. And to cheer me up, <laughs> you decided it would be a good... Do you remember this? Or yeah, have I yeah, imagined I it? No. Where you decided it would be a good idea to attempt to wank me off with the hand of a ventriloquist dummy... <laughs> that had been made by my great-grandfather yeah. in 1895. Well, <laughs> I knew that. Yes. No, I knew that it was very important. <laughs> <laughs> my great-grandfather could never have imagined, as he sculpted that hand out of papier-mâché, <laughs> what it would be well, used for. Why did you do that? Well, first of all, <laughs> can, you, can you remember... What you were upset about? It's something about Rich Canning, I think, wasn't it? Was it about? Okay, well, we know the... something. Probably. I right. think it was. It wasn't some... a, I wasn't upset that I hadn't yet been wanked off by a, a man utilising a ventriloquist dummy. That wasn't what I was like. If mate, you, th- if you mate, thought that mate. that was what it was, no. you were sadly mistaken. Okay, is it just me? Or look, there's a man leaving there. He's going. He's going. I didn't come here to hear a description of a man being masturbated with the papier-mâché hand of his own great-grandfather's hand-sculpted ventriloquist puppet. You're probably the third person... And yet person, it appears he did. You're probably but, the third person to touch my penis. Well, it wasn't... I didn't touch Fire. it. With, I didn't touch oh, yeah. it. <laughs> what? <laughs> did Ali suddenly acquire the ability to move his hand around I my... didn't touch it. <laughs> it was no more me than it would be if Orville had raped you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
what it is, is, do you know, like, when someone's really upset about something and they're crying, do you ever get this where you think, oh, I could try and say something really consoling and sensitive here, or I could do the most inappropriate thing I could possibly think of, which may, like, sort of jolt them out of... Uh, you've done that. When Pete Bainham told you his... Um... Well, yeah, there was both ways around. Pete Bainham did it to me. When, well, did, when my granddad, then? who gave me that ventriloquist dummy, handed it down from his father to me, um, uh, he, when he died, I went to... It was, it was the other way around, then you write back in your right, book. Yeah, I went, yeah. We did it both ways in the end. But um, I came back to the, uh, the flat I shared with Peter Bainham at that point. He was in the kitchen, and I came in. I was quite, my granddad had died. I was very upset. We'd been to the funeral. And Peter Bain turned to me as I walked through a door and he said, I am delighted your grandfather is dead. <laughs> and it made me kind of laugh and cry simultaneously. I've never... I genuinely... <laughs> because the use of the word delighted... Yeah, yeah, it's, really delighted. it's so polite and formal. It's really funny. So when his dad died, I did it back to him as well. When his dad died? Oh, yeah, when, when That's much dead. worse than your grandfather. <laughs> so that's... I think actually, when his dad died, I came in with a smirk, and he said, and he, and he said, and Pete preempted it, and he said, "Are you delighted?" Well, I saw you were upset, and I thought, I bet he wouldn't expect me to try to masturbate him. With the papier mache yeah. hand of his great grandfather. It was only for a little while. I, I didn't, know, yeah, I didn't get erect or anything. I'm yeah. not turned on by that kind of thing. Not now, maybe, but not then. No, I just think. I think I, I've never done anything like it since. I, think I thought it was. <laughs> I just think I thought. It's it rare be, you get the opportunity, I though. There's, there's be, a dummy there and a crying <laughs> man. <laughs> I you need well, both yeah. those things to I come together. It would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. <laughs> so I did it. Yeah, good. but I mean, it's it was, wasn't it? It, it was, was but you know, if, when I started, when I, I, I blanked out from my memory for a long time, and I think it came back to me during a podcast, and I wasn't sure whether it actually happened. <laughs> I was just think that kind of the, the yeah. Olivier Award-winning director, <laughs> Stuart Lee, kind of can't find. I think Lawrence Olivier probably did quite a lot. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you another piece of housekeeping that I have to ask everyone in this. I've, I've yeah. asked everyone, we'll get this out of the way while we're on the subject. I've been asking all my guests this, apart from Jonathan Ross, who I forgot to ask. Have you ever attempted to suck He's your own He's the one cock? person who could probably have done it. <laughs> he probably is. Yeah, yeah. From what I have, three turkeys yeah. can get on there. Have you ever attempted to suck your own cock, Stuart? Uh, no, I haven't. And no. I, now I, I can barely tie my own shoe. <laughs> I think out there, the listeners to this podcast, I think a lot of people who haven't tried it yeah. have listened to this and then probably tried. Yeah, well, you must and be very proud anyone. of what you <laughs> It's opened a new... Six, 70% of people have those two, so you're in the minority by yeah. not attempting Well, it. I also don't use Twitter. <laughs> so I feel it's very similar to sort of suck you out. <laughs> Right, in Edinburgh, this is the other thing I've mentioned in the podcast. I don't know if you remember this one, and I don't know if you are guilty or not of this one. When we shared a flight in Edinburgh in 2002, we had a, we had a conversation, and then when I woke up in the morning, we were all a bit drunk, all the cupboards in the kitchen were all smashed in, like someone had punched them. I don't remember that. Yeah. Who did that, Stuart? Me. It was, it was either you, me, and I've forgotten, Richard Thomas, who was living in the flat that year, Chris Addison, he wouldn't punch some... He wouldn't punch some cupboards. <laughs> Maybe Dan Antoposky. God, I've got no memory of that. Don't you remember? Wow, well, it might have been you. Well, I don't remember it. What was the conversation about? I don't. I think we were was talking. It, how about... would you best smash? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I annoyed you about something. I can't remember what it was. I'd annoyed you. Really? I'm really sorry. I've got no memory of that whatsoever. Okay. No, well, that I'm, not saying... I'm not saying you did it. No, I'm not saying I did it. But um, no, I, I reckon remember... you did. I remember that <laughs> flat as being a very harmonious It was. One. It was just one night where, for some reason... I think I, I, what I said was... Um, this is quite... This, but it was not I even bet about... you couldn't smash the <laughs> I said, have you ever attempted to suck... Uh, adventure with dummies yeah. cock. Uh, I, uh, I said I was. I came in and I was talking about that. We it was the year I was doing Talk Cock the first time, and mm. you were doing Jerry Spring of the Opera. And I said, what's interesting about this? That these have both been quite successful shows. But four, four or five years ago, we wouldn't have even attempted to do either of these shows yeah, yeah. because of their content. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we we kind of made a pact when we first met in uh, yeah, yeah. 1989. 
no, 1986. We uh, we did a, we hadn't seen each other. I did a song called "My Penis Can Sing" yeah. that you hadn't seen, yeah. uh, and you'd done a, a sketch about people uh, queuing at a, a bus stop with fruit. Do you remember oh, that? No. <laughs> No one else remembers that one. I, that's, no. Everything he's done since then isn't as good for me. That is, I liked him when he did the bus stop fruit sketch no. that I didn't actually see. Uh, we, met a, we met a party and we decided to write together and then we made it very early on. We said, right, what we're going to do is we'll, make, we'll define ourselves by what we won't do sketches. Yeah. So we that, wouldn't do anything about um, yeah. TV parodies yeah. or... Uh, it's funny. That, well, in, in, in the new stand-up show, I do a 20-minute bit um, where I compare the Thatcher government's economic policies in the 80s to the plot line of a Scooby-Doo cartoon film <laughs> called Scooby-Doo in the Pirate Zombie Jungle Island. And um, I do that because my, the joke is that, as a father, my only frame of reference is watching Scooby-Doo with my son. Then at the end of that whole bit, it's about 20 minutes long, I go... It get, ideally, it gets applause, and then I go, don't clap a Scooby-Doo Thatcher routine. <laughs> in 1986, I made... Uh, when I first started writing comedy with Richard Herring... I'm, we made a list of ten things that we thought were too cliché to do jokes about, and two of the things on that list of ten things were Scooby Doo and Thatcher. <laughs> we all grew up to be the person we despised as teenagers. <laughs> so I'm kind of I remember that list. Yeah. But so we I, weren't you know, like we said we were yeah. because everyone was doing things about Fergie having a fat yeah, ass, yeah, or yeah. I mean, it wasn't John May just being grey, but it was yeah. it was that kind of thing. Which yeah. was then later on. So we made that decision, but both doing we, if we'd said. Let's do an op- let's do an opera yeah. based on Jerry Springer. Just this is the idea. Yeah, it wasn't my idea. And if, you know, it wasn't your yeah, idea. Yeah. But but it's you know it's the way you execute. For, yeah, well, funny if I like would, doing a whole show about penises. Yeah. It would be the the no, most I, obvious. I wouldn't have had thing. that idea actually because I'd have thought that that's sort of why would you do that? And, I'm, yeah. and and actually what what working on that made me think is that actually subject material is not the problem. No, it's like how you how you handle it and and re- that's what I learned from Richard Thomas is actually there's no such thing as bad subject material. It's only it's all about um, how it's written, performed, and the tone of it, which is why it's really weird when you get these writing briefs from TV executives right, where they say, we're not interested in stuff about this, this, and this. And you think, well, it's not a point. It, what, what, what it's about doesn't matter. No. Because um, some of the greatest sitcoms of all time are about pretty dull things, and some of the great stand-up routines are about really, uh, really... You know, really obvious everyday things. It's about the language and the performance. Did I read on Chalk today that BBC Three? Do you see this? BBC yeah, are yeah. looking for. And I thought they. I thought they'd done a list of the three things that you mustn't do. Right? Yeah, they usually yeah. you go. Usually they go. Don't do a, a, yeah. a common thing about someone who's just won the lottery. Don't do a thing about two misfit brothers moving in together and yeah. having to live together. So there are these obvious things that everyone writes about, but they listed three things that they wanted. They were quite specific. Yeah. Uh, like one of them was a, two brothers move in together to an, a, a factory, a family business that they have that's not to say that those couldn't be really good sitcoms because actually it doesn't really matter what the subject is but it's odd for them to be looking for a a very specific uh, very specific thing so why would you look for why would you look for a sitcom about a subject it doesn't make any sense no because um, it's never the subject that excites me and there are lots of sitcoms about vicars but there's only one Father Ted that's Father Ted yes (laughs) But I think you know. I think you could write a sitcom about someone who ran a hotel in in Torquay. Yeah, and uh, it would be a different. You know, yeah, yeah. it's not like the it's not yeah. the situation is what you no. is what you do with the characters, and if you can make enduring characters, it's yeah. like things are dis- things are discounted yeah. because they're like something else, well, or they're taken uh, up because they're like something else. Yeah, well, given how I agree with you about that, it seems unlikely I would have smashed these couples. It up. does. <laughs> <laughs> but who did smash them? I don't know. It's mystery. Yeah. Might have been Richard Thomas. Might have been. I don't remember anything about it. Filled with anger. Yeah. I think you were quite drunk at the time. You might have just, you know... I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not accusing you. I'm no, just... I'm, right. I'm, I just did something I brought it. up in a no, podcast before. Sorry, now I've got you here. I thought I'd try and get to the yeah, bottom no, of it. not come up I'm gonna before. It's going to have to be another ten years of... We'll, yeah. find, a, we'll find a clue. <laughs> we'll find... Get Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Margaret yeah. Thatcher. That could be your next series of podcasts. Richard Herring's cupboard smashing clue out. <laughs> Each week, Richard Herring f- tries to find out who smashed some cupboards in 2002. Who suspects a, are brought in and interrogated. There was a small amount of ventriloquist dummy semen on the handles. So that's why. That's why. That's why I suspected you. Which is made of shredded 1898 newspaper. Uh, 
cool. Uh, my favourite thing you ever did, and I'm wondering if you're ever going to bring this back. I think the funny, I genuinely think the funniest thing you've ever done is Pliny from His Store and Pliny. Yeah, I know, a lot of people said that. Well, <laughs> genuinely. I've got the puppet. Yeah, I've got my, I've got the history. My puppet. voice is broken now, <laughs> which uh, it hadn't, I don't think I could do the voice. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Try and do it. I can't even remember yeah. what he spoke like. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't know what it was. Oh, you've, got the, you've got to go and look on YouTube. We won't, we won't be yeah, able to no, recreate no. it now. Yeah. It was amazing. What I loved about it, we recorded... I watched about four or five of them, and they were really making me laugh. Because uh, it's just... It's, I'm just we should write a sitcom with them in it. With yeah, history, yeah. But they, they, we recorded those like at the, at the end of a day, all of them, all in a row. <laughs> and we were really tired anyway. And yeah. you can, our voices are just completely changing. The accent's going. The kind of puppets, <laughs> they were really heavy and we had to go underneath them. And my, my one was especially heavy. Mine just is like, like at a 45 degree angle. There's one bit where I have to pick something, where Histor's meant to be picking something up with his uh, wing. And I'm not as good with puppets as you are. Uh, Manipulate. <laughs> Them. I mean, you apparently could just pick up a puppet and make it masturbate a man's penis without touching his penis. That is an amazing skill. But like the wing of Histor is like a foot away from the from the body of Histor, yeah. and I was trying my best to do it. Well, it wasn't like we were trying to do it badly. We we're yeah. trying our well, best. Well, you know, to do it well. I, I, I hope we can get the rights to those because actually, <laughs> the, the interesting thing. I mean, a, a fist of fun. We had a budget for it and time, and um, and yet. I think there's lots of things in this order to do that were done on nothing in a minute that are quite good. But you know, you know it's be quite interesting to see that again. But I don't yeah, know if we'll, we'll we be able to get it. But yeah, no, for Histor's I was. Um, I remember that that was you know that was quite. Uh, well, Pliny is very stupid and just like yeah. saying egg about everything. Yeah. <laughs> But then every, every, every sketch, there'd be one moment of kind of lucidity where he would explain yeah. the truth from a kind of left-wing perspective to St. George. And you kind of think, what's Pliny doing? Why, well, he's pretending to be really stupid, but he's really, yeah. really clever. And to enjoy saying puns about eggs and crows, yeah. about everything, even though well, they don't sound like it. And my, then he's, my subsequent look solo success to stand-up has basically been based on channeling that character yeah. <laughs> as a man I just think you know you should do broader stuff sometimes because yeah. that it was that pl- why don't you Stuart Lee is one thing and then just I don't, I don't think even his store should be in it yeah uh, there should be Pliny on well, his I'll own I'll do that I'll do, I, will, I will do that I'll do okay. a whole <laughs> one of the next series as a crow <laughs> But we actually, we forgot to take, that. this, uh, to, this oh, yeah, morning Richard yeah. Judy ended and we forgot to take any of the puppets and I think Pliny had died and was there, he was all covered in white, I remember the last yeah. time I saw him because he was a ghost. Uh, and we just left them in the studio and forgot all about them and then about four years later they were on Live and Kicking or something, yeah. just in the background of some sketch, <laughs> sort of been thrown around. <laughs> <laughs> and used in a. They, we, we, well, forgot, we forgot about yeah. them. We got them back. My well, we were able to up. get them back under the pretense that we'd. Um, they were characters that we'd invented, therefore they weren't allowed to be, you know, used in. Yeah, the, it's true. And we sh- it's, rid- it's outrageous that we. Yeah. This is. You know, a lot of people listen to this. It's, it's a very puppet based <laughs> podcast, I realise. <laughs> but, you know, maybe we could get all the yeah. puppets together. I've got Ali and Sally and Histor and. Oh, who knows what might happen? A few vodka and Red Bulls? Yeah. <laughs> Puppetry on the rate on the podcast. Yeah. Good, is it? yeah. When you say that, I play snooker against myself. Though. I know, yeah, yeah. That's a very visual You know when thing. you said um, backstage you were saying that all these, they seem to reach a po- period in the podcast, your interviews, when there's a kind of lull yeah. and then it picks up again. <laughs> yeah. Is that where we are Yeah, now? I think it's been, it's been mainly that all the way through. Oh, okay. like, <laughs> It's been mainly lull this time, right, but it's right. quite nice. It's quite nice and uh, chilled out. People right. are hanging on our every word. Yeah. It's just a pity there's nothing very interesting yeah, coming, yeah, yeah. <laughs> coming out. Um, let's have a look what else I wanted to talk to you about on my, on my list of stuff. Because it's ridiculous, this, because I know too much about... We've talked about, yeah. talk about quite a lot. Now, what I think what's quite interesting about you is that your character... It's kind of... It's kind of this is... I'm, I've turned into properly into David Frost in this one. Um, is that your character of Stuart Lee that isn't you is based on being a kind of outsider and a bit of a failure mm, yeah. and now you are in actually a much higher status than the <coughs> character you used well, to have sort of although although you know it, 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 it's been quite it, it, there's been just enough in the last couple of years that for example you know after the first series of um, Comedy Vehicle they didn't want to recommission it 
So that was sort of left for about a year and a half. And then the setting series, they didn't want to recommission it. And actually, when I started writing the stand-up tour after that, one of the sort of status-lowering threads in it was that I'd done this thing and it was perceived as doing well, but they weren't going to recommission it. Then when, when I got the British Comedy Awards, it was sort of the second one was cut out of the broadcast and it wasn't mentioned in the newspapers. The BAFTA Award was cut out of the broadcast. It wasn't mentioned in the newspapers. But I do... You're absolutely right. And I mean, and it, and it, it probably... It probably um, you can't you can't do that again. You know, no. you probably come come back and have to do something different. Although, <clears throat> although there, in, in as much as you separate yourself out from the character of the comedian you pretend to be, the the Stuart Lee comedian is so sort of paranoid and suspicious that he would still feel hard done by whatever had happened to him. But you're right. But you're right. It doesn't. It doesn't really make sense. But it also, well, uh, David Badiel was talking about this to me last yeah. week. Uh, that it, when you are when you are taking the piss out of other comedians, which me. is kind of yeah, when you're taking when the piss, do. yeah, when you're yeah. taking the piss out of other comedians in in your sketches and stuff, that yeah. actually you're st- within the industry and within comedy, your status is incredibly high. Yeah, so but, not although, the, but not in the world. But I don't know. I think I think well, not, not in the, you know like. My own family aren't really aware that I'm on television. You know, it's, like, it's like, honestly, I'm not. I'm not. It's not. You know, it might be, but the, 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 there's nobody I take the piss out of that isn't doing rooms five times the size. But it's like not I necessarily am. about this because it's also about whether yeah. you see doing big rooms as being more important. You know, you've got the critical no, acclaim. So you're saying, no. like with Russell Howard, for example, Russell Howard will probably never get who I think is fantastic comedian, yeah. but he will probably never get um, the. Guardian saying is a fantastic comedian. So when well, you might, so in a way by your yeah. status rising, even though I know this isn't yeah, what you're doing it yeah. for, but do, does it does it get to a point where that could be seen as like well? You know what? I mean, that, 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 that's interesting because that sort of while I was working out the material for that show, for that series, I was sort of aware that the, the, the critical perception of me was changing to the point where it would be weird to um, take the piss out of those people. And, uh, but, but it wasn't... Act- but again, that, the particular routine you're talking about, about Russell Howard, I mean, I did it here every night for three months, so I remember it pretty well. But it was... It was the, the, the idea was that he, would, that he would do, like, one charity event, and everyone would go, oh, it's brilliant. And yet it would be a tiny percentage of his presumed income, as reported in newspapers, of £4 million pounds a year. Whereas the bitter Stuart Lee comedian would do like two benefits a month forever, and uh, was not that wouldn't be a news story. So kind of in a way, I had no opinion about him. I didn't really even know what his material was at the time. So you know, and but he was um, he did seem to when I met him around that time, I was quite upset about it. Yeah, I th- well, I think but, because <laughs> I mean, I, 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 no, he, is, he was upset about yeah, it, yeah, but I, I, I think. Um, I mean, I think in a way, I completely see, because I think the routine's so stupid that yeah. you're saying, because you're saying yeah, no. it's a mathematical joke of you yeah, saying, because he yeah. wouldn't, if he did it every day, it's he like wouldn't, something you he wouldn't, yeah, he wouldn't, yeah. He wouldn't yeah. make the money. So yeah. it's not really a joke about no, him. No. But I think because you're, they, you know, those kids all grew up liking you yeah, as a stand-up, and then it's kind of weird for you. It may be, and I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I think this, but maybe yeah. it is perceived because the status of your character's changed without necessarily you... Being aware, being of, aware it. of it, yeah, but also, that it turns from being the un- underdog kind of. I know, yeah, but I know, yeah. I know you're right. But I mean, but on the other hand, I, I don't, I don't have enough of an audience to do the gigs of the size he does, and you couldn't. There's no way you could massage the figures of my income to be four million pounds a year. But would you want that? Because it, but no, also, would, you, you want not. to do it, and also. That audience isn't ga- your audience is pretty no, much know. guaranteed. For, if you can fill this room yeah, for nine weeks, then yeah, you don't yeah. really have to worry about yeah, I know, working yeah, yeah. ever no, again. No, no, you're right. Yeah, so was, and, those, and you'll be able to do yeah. that until for, I'm, yeah. I'm dead, which will be soon. But even if you were never on TV yeah. again, even yeah. you know, if you were I mean, no, I know. probably if you were found having sex with the child, yeah, no, well, that might no. that might. Yeah. <laughs> but not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> In some ways, it might. It would be a different <laughs> audience. <laughs> but, um, He'd be very much like my audience. Yeah, get no, there. Yeah. no, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're, you're right, and I, and I sort of didn't. I hadn't really factored this in, you know, when I because you're so used to being an irrelevant figure. Yeah. That there's some when you're irrelevant, when you're largely irrelevant, <laughs> there's something sort of heroic about um, having a, having a pop at people, you know, because it's like you're doing it from the bottom of the pile, and then kind of weirdly that that sort of changed, and the material was like a year behind the perception, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I was doing a benefit for um, uh, New Zealand earthquake victims and um, 
Russell Howard was on, which is weird because he doesn't do a lot of benefits. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was there, and um, people were going to me, oh, Russell Howard's on, and you know, he hadn't been out on, on telly at the point, this, this piece. But he, you know, he knows you're doing this bit about him, aren't you embarrassed? And I went, no, because if he sees it, he'll know that it's like it's a kind of mad mathematical joke, and the joke's kind of on me as this person who feels hard done by. But then he did. He talked to me about it backstage, and I was trying to sort of explain it, um, which was it was it was going all right. But then <laughs> it was it was going all right. But then his manager had been standing like hiding behind a curtain um, with his back to me. So in the dark where I couldn't see him and then I was like going this, yeah, yeah yeah James Taylor yeah. yeah and then he turned around and he went tell him about when you say this <laughs> it was really weird it was like um, but I know I'm sorry if, I, I'm sorry if I was saying but I kind of think it was not it was sort of to me it was kind of I don't even really know what his act is I don't really know anything about him <laughs> other than that I'd read that he'd earned four million pounds a year and then about two days later I read that he'd made 35,000 I think so the thing is, he does, I think the problem is he doesn't earn four million pounds. No, I know, yeah. So, but, where I mean, did, but, my, but my question is, where did that story come from? Yeah. You know, and, and the weird thing is, I got, because I'm also a quasi-journalist, I got sent a press release about two months ago about him doing um, two gig benefits in London. But 90% of the words on that press release were about um, how many videos he'd sold and how many people he'd played to the rest of the years. So I think it's actually a problem of... It's difficult when PR uses charity as a marketing tool, and that's sort of what that was about. Yeah. You know, and um, because uh, as soon as you, if if you have a paragraph about the charitable donation, but the other ninety percent of the words on the press release are about your selling out sixteen thousand seater rooms, it inevitably starts to seem slightly strange you know so that was then uh, so I, I kind of thought oh yeah i misjudged that but then this press release came in about two months ago and i thought no it's like that's just an ongoing weird thing for celebrities where where but, sometimes but then a lot of that's not even in their control no it's not in their control and that's why i but you and i will I, I make sure yeah, I, know, I write all right. my own press yeah, releases I, I mean, you know that's why you said to me you're a control freak i mean, actually <laughs> i actually couldn't i couldn't cope with the seeding of control that is required to be better known i couldn't do it and and yet and, and yet and yet i'm aware that i hypocritically perceive that as a moral decision but actually it's a psychological one i actually could not cope with it so the idea that it's in some way you've made some moral decision about not doing it is a lie because actually you couldn't do it anyway because you'd just go mad and you couldn't cope not as good as Nick Frost with that rod of spunk going in his face, is it? <laughs> Not as good. But you asked me that question. I know. <laughs> I know it, but I think it's you know. because I think, like with Ricky Gervais, I think he carried on that persona that he had early on, which was, yeah. oh, I've won some BAFTAs and uh, oh, this, you know. But he carried it on way too long to the yeah. point that it, it, when it started, it looked, yeah. did kind of look like mock humble, but not humble. But yeah. then he, ca- he didn't, was unaware. I mean, I think you'll never be in the position where no. you're unaware. I think you think about every single uh, step yeah. and what's going on. And I mean, you sort of second guess the critics and sort of put that in before it's come out. You know yeah, what I mean? Do, yeah, you yeah. use your negative publicity. What's yeah. the worst uh, reviews of yourself that you've well, used in your own... There's so, well, um, there are just so many terrible ones now. It's sort of beyond... <laughs> It's, be, it's kind of, it's not, you know, the worst ones are worse than you could ever <laughs> have imagined. But even so, even though you can put, I put things on posters saying, oh, actually, brilliant. The, the Sun one, uh, a couple of years ago, was the worst comedian in Britain, as funny as Bubonic Plague, <laughs> Fergus Shanahan, who's now been arrested as part of the... Um, <laughs> 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 but, uh, <yeah. laughs> David Bedeal's reviews he told us about last week were pretty bad. I think you'd, you'd have to <laughs> say that... Uh, uh, yeah, the three lions was worse than the uh, concentration camps thing. Yeah, Basically, yeah. it was something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was something like that. Uh, but then, who is the real sick man in this so-called no, no, society? No, no. Well done. I just I'd, I'd throw it in because yeah. look, see, one bloke, the blo- yeah. one bloke. <laughs> applauded. And you do in your website, you do a thing called uh, plagiarism corner. Yeah. Which so do you think though? I mean, because a lot of the things in I there. Know, it's misunderstood plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism corner is um, a bit where. If there's something the same as something I've done, <laughs> I put it up there, right? And um, and but but I also put up things that uh, predate the thing that I've done. Um, 
that's the same as them. And um, people seem to miss the point about this. I mean, part, partly the, there's two there's two reasons there's two things I'm trying to do with plagiarism corner. One is to show that some ideas kind of exist out there, and you can arrive at them independently of someone else. In as much as there's a bit of Tony Allen, the Godfather of alternative comedy, in 1991 doing something that is exactly the same as something I've done in the last couple of years. I honestly say I never saw him do it. Um, but uh, the, the other reason I put things up on Plagiarism Corner is because I think there's a lot of um, people out there now using lots of writers, which wasn't when we started in the 1980s <laughs> of alternative comedy. There was this kind of fantasy that the comedian was an auteur. And the idea was that we developed our own work and we were our own authentic voice. Now, a mainstream alternative comedian is required to produce so much stuff, they inevitably use writers. And the writers aren't always as, um, you know, <laughs> careful about their source material. Yeah. So when you see something in the mouth of someone on telly that is like something you've done, I kind of think, yeah, they might have... That might have come third-hand from a writer, and they don't know. So partly, when I do that, it's to sort of send a shot across the bows as well, of like, leave me alone, yeah. or I will do this. Um, and then there's someone deciding to Dave. do that at this point. <laughs> <laughs> gonna... um, well, no, because there's one uh, from Buscock, never mind the Buscocks, of, the, of them oh, yeah, being know, put yeah. in storage, yeah. which is exactly like where we ended Fist of Fun with us being yeah. put in storage next to the glam metal detectives yeah. in our boxes, the first series. And that's just basically just completely copied to the extent yeah. even the guys who take them away are wearing exactly the same. Yeah, I mean, well, the other, thing, the other thing that's weird is there's a whole kind of culture now. People think they're doing homages to things. But, they, but people forget that because they know about something, yeah. it doesn't mean that everyone You can't does, do so. a homage to Fist of Fun. You can't do a homage to something that has never been available on DVD. <laughs> or, because the average person's not going to get the source material. You, know, and the, you see this happen to sort of art all the time. Like when Paris, Texas came out in the early 80s, of Vin Vendor's film, it sort of defined this amazing aesthetic of like slide guitar music crossed with widescreen American landscapes. And within two years, that was a cliche of advertising. So people were bored of it. But most of the people that were bored of it didn't know what the source material was. So I kind of think you have to watch out for the homages as well, you know. Uh, so I, I don't mean it entirely seriously. No, no. Um, like, Dyer O'Brien had a real go at me about it, saying you should take it down. And I went, well, the thing is, there's things that... There's things on there where I've sort of done myself in, you know. And there's also... I had a bit up for a bit, I think it's gone now, where, like... Marky e. Smith from the four was on stage saying I'd copied him, <laughs> and you know I sort of had a bit really, so I thought it was fair enough, you know. But, but all art is, uh, you know, is influenced yeah. by previous generations. Well, you know, I think both of us were very influenced by Ted Chippington. Yeah, yeah. Um, which well, when we did the when we did the concert for T Ted Chippington in two thousand and seven or two thousand and eight, when we did our early material and yeah, stuff, you obvious. kind of really see that yeah. how. I mean, he's an amazing comedian, Ted Chippington, Birmingham yeah. comedian from the 1980s, yeah. early 1980s. He started well, no, I guess. still, I mean, I'm aware of that. Sometimes as I say things, I'm aware that there's a cadence of his voice in it. Yeah. You, can, you can't really escape the things that got you when you were 15. You kind of still can't do it. But that's what it, but that's, but I mean, I think when reading your book, this is getting very serious. Sorry anyone, anyone rejecting? No, that's right. Uh, this, you know, all of these are different. That's what I like about it. But when you read your book, it is. I mean, I think I was. Call, I wrote a blog about calling you the Midas, the King Midas Magpie, because it's like mm. you. You do. You, you know. You admit where you've taken a joke from in yeah. your when you in your carefully annotated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> footnote heavy. Well, not a joke, but like a. A, f a flavour or yeah, a yeah, tone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's not. It's not ever stealing a joke, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's taking an idea. But then yeah. actually, you take an idea that. Well, it's like, you know, with, that, with the All Things Bright and Beautiful yeah. sketch you did, for example, yeah. we, they, that came about by us going to a wedding, yeah. and you, we, we, they sang All Things Bright and Beautiful, and me, I was with, it was a showbiz thing, it was like yeah. one of our agents, and I was standing next to Rob Newman, and we were just laughing at how ridiculous All Things Bright and Beautiful was, yeah. and we just got the real giggles, and you're going, what, what's, what's funny about this? Right. And, I said, and I said, this is what's funny about this, and then I would never have thought of no. doing anything about it again, and then... You took that one idea and, yeah. and turned into this kind of amazing... Well, it's very to... kind of you to be uh, generous about the fact that I essentially sort of was like a psychic vampire <laughs> feeding off but you. But I would never have thought... I mean, yeah. I would never... I would have no where to put that at the time, but I would, also I would never have yeah. thought of doing it. It's the execution... It's exactly it's what you said before. Well, it's, it's, the it's about... You know, there's a weird thing now as well. There's, there's nothing... It's like worries me about Twitter, actually, the internet. It's like your own experiences becoming... Like, like you know, everyone involved knows that the... Alan Partridge, you're a mentalist episode where the guy's 
traps Alan Partridge in a cellar is sort of slightly based on something that happened to me yeah. that I told Pete Bainham about and he went off and, and wrote it. But that was like my life and I feel like I should have had the right to exploit that for comic effect if I'd wanted to. <laughs> but before I decided whether to do that or not, it became an episode in Alan Partridge. Yeah, but Jerry Springer wanted to write an opera about himself <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was so nothing. Well, you know, there was a thing. Well, there's a part in it, bit in Alan Partridge, which is something I really wanted. That I, I think I told against myself. But right. he, when I was in, uh, I think we were in the Riverside actually, and someone, someone came up to me and said, "Are you Rich Herring?" It was just when we'd just got on TV the first time. He said, "Are you Rich Herring?" And I went, "Yeah." He said, uh, "You drop your credit card." <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No, I've and heard, that's, that's I've just heard that Patrick. told like third hand. <laughs> yeah. It's like what a twat you are. <laughs> yeah, but actually, you know, yeah, no, but that's a, that's a, you know a lot of things. Basically, um, Alan Partridge is mainly based on things that happened to us, <laughs> <laughs> and we created the character in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So you know, so yeah. Enough. Don't get yeah. any of the money from it, though, do we? No, 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 never mind. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk to Armando about it next week. I'll to ask, is it true, Armando, that we created <laughs> Alan Partridge? Let's see what yeah, he says. We had, a, we had a falling out about that. And I, we, we, we were some of the original writers on the air, which that character came out of, and we had a bust-up with our then manager about whether we should get rights over the character of Alan Partridge when it went to telly. And in the end, it was decided that we wouldn't, but not by us. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but probably fair enough, to be honest. But I, I always thought that it had never been resolved and I always felt really bad that this cloud was hanging over my life where I'd had this argument with Armando that had never finished. Then a book came out about Chris Morris, Disgusting Bliss. Yeah. And I read it and Armando was interviewed in it and he said that on a flight to Glasgow when we were doing some radio thing with him, there had been really bad turbulence yeah. and I discussed with him. I said, look, we might die on this <laughs> flight so let's just resolve the issue that I don't mind about what happened with Alan Partridge. I've got, I have no memory of that whatsoever. So it was really great <laughs> to read it in a book. I, I thought, oh, what a reasonable bloke I was <laughs> to resolve that. Well, I have no memory of it, it whatsoever. It did happen, I remember. Do you um, remember? Yeah, I don't I remember, remember it at all. I don't remember, I don't remember a lot about it. You don't the, remember what happens in the morning. When we used to write with each other, <laughs> yeah. in the premiere travelling across yeah, the yeah, road. Yeah. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Pre- we, you, I would tell you a story in the morning or something that happened mm. and you would tell me in the afternoon. You would tell me <laughs> yeah. you would tell me something I just told you. I can't remember <laughs> much about the 90s at all. I don't no. know what's wrong with me. Yeah. Were you on in some heart drugs or something? <laughs> I don't know what it was. I wasn't no. on anything. I don't no. know what it was. I don't know. <laughs> but it's quite good to have that to not know. You well, it's good to come here and find out what was going on. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And let's quickly talk about Club Z, which is again was this nineteen uh, nineties. You uh, were in that Club Z a was very, a, yeah. very, You made me one again. Let's see, I've got another <laughs> memory. I was hardly ever allowed to be in Club Z, but sometimes Stu would let me be in it. And he said one Christmas, he said, "What I want you to do is come on dressed in your pants, wearing a gas mask and a Father Christmas, Father Christmas outfit, and I'll have you. I'll have a whip." You had a whip. Did I have a whip? Yeah. I don't remember that. Or I might have even been on a leash. I think you were on a leash. And yeah. uh, you made me go into the audience and give out presents with which you had. <laughs> they were wrapped up, but you did cut, you'd got a hardcore porn mag and cut out erect penises and stuck them on to. Yeah. And I had to go into the audience and give these presents to people, and then I had to touch the audience, and every time I was inappropriate, you would shout and pull the chain or yank. Yeah. It was the best what Christmas was Rich ever had. <laughs> it was good. It was actually, it was very liberating because I was disguised yeah. and I was able to go and just grope people. It was quite good. Yeah. When, in the mid-90s, that was quite good for actually, me. Actually, there's funny, if it, Club Z was a cabaret sort of night that was set up by Simon Munnery in, uh, in the Market Tavern. Don't look for it, it's not there anymore, in, uh, <laughs> Newington, in um, Islington Green. And all sorts of people went through it and did lots of different acts. And the rules were that you weren't allowed. It had to be comedy, but you weren't allowed to do stand-up. And um, it was, you know, we did some Edinburgh shows of it, and there was a TV pilot. In the end, it all came to nothing. And then a, a few years ago, a young journalist called Robert Ringham found out about it, and he decided to write a book about it, despite never having seen it. And the book's out now. It's published by uh, through Chris uh, Evans's Go Faster Stripe uh, imprint. And what's really interesting about it is it's compiled from entirely conflicting memories of um, <laughs> people that were out of their minds during that period and can't really remember what was going on. There's actually a really interesting book of, like, have you seen one? Of, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Conflicting, conflicting stories that don't add up. And um, it also makes you think how long ago that suddenly is. I mean, it's like 
being in the 80s and talking about the 60s, it's really strange how, how long ago it was. And um, also how we could afford then. We had, no one had any money, but we could afford... We were time rich. So I could spend all week wrapping up children's toys in pages cut out of hardcore <laughs> pornography uh, to give them to Richard Herring to distribute to people at Christmas. Now, that would not be a cost-effective use of my time. I, I've still got time to do that. <laughs> I'll always make time for that. <laughs> Whatever. But it, was, it was, but it was one of those things, again, that felt... I mean, there's so many things, there's so many opportunities that come and go, and so many... I mean, so I was reading, someone had posted on Facebook that letter about the first response to Faulty Towers from a BBC executive yeah. going, this is, the show's as bad as the title, this is just rubbish and stock characters and no one will ever like it, signed Ian Mil- Milne or something, you know, and then that's funny because yeah. that show did get made and was really brilliant. Yeah. But think of all the shows that were really brilliant and that, le- that letter meant the show didn't get yeah, made yeah, yeah. and there's millions and millions of things I mean, Club Z's one of those ones that you really think the pile of that was great and all the leading up to it and yeah. it would have been amazing I mean it's sort of again it, it led into Jerry Spring the opera and it led into uh, the, the stuff that Simon well, it's the stuff that Simon yeah, was but doing that, but Simon, know, never, was... Simon Munnery never got the no, but that didn't. kind of credit no, for everyone, it. everyone that had worked with him benefited from being inspired by him that's a really weird thing reminds me of someone else <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> Robert Ringham needs to write about a book about you, about um, people's conflicting memories. Perhaps it will solve this smashed cupboard <laughs> issue. But what Rich said is absolutely right, and that's why, that's why I found it difficult when Kate Thornton um, interviewed me at the BAFTAs and said, aren't you excited about winning a BAFTA? I found it difficult to muster any enthusiasm for the idea because over 25 years of doing this, I know that most of the people that are much, much better than me have given up or been ignored or, you know, it, it's sort of, so you can't, it, it's so, there's such a degree of randomness in it that I don't understand. I mean, I remember you were obsessed with a bloke for a bit. I, I don't know who he was. He, he, he was a Welsh guy and he'd won something on television. And when it, when it happened, he shouted out, Justice. <laughs> who was that? Who was that? <laughs> it was the, I think it was the Sabutio World Cup. <laughs> It was televised. It was me and Al Murray. It was Al Murray. <laughs> and it was... Uh, I can't even remember the story. It was like they were playing... But then someone won the game of Sabutio. That they'd, they'd, been be- they'd been cruelly beaten in an earlier round. And he won. And he went, Justice! Yeah. But in to the say face of this the guy. word justice suggests that there's some kind of moral <laughs> right behind what has happened and that he's, he's been not recognised for so long. And that funny... I mean, the, the idea that you could attach any value to winning something you know it seems it's just not in my mindset so I, I just you just have to push on but you know the alternative would be to get the BAFTA and go <laughs> justice <Yeah. like> that, <laughs> which is clearly laughable when Limmy shows on or you know there's, lo- there's loads of things that are great that no one ever notices and there's loads of things that are great that never even get made and there's loads of people doing comedy that are brilliant and are much better than anyone any of us will ever hear of. And we've, you know, we've seen loads of them over the years. So you kind of, you kind of can't... I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. Even, even at awards seminars when people try and be ironically arrogant, it still doesn't work because there's, there's actually... It's just statistically and logistically impossible that the best people will be being awarded for the things that they are. Yeah. You well, know? the things that, are, you know, the thing... The things that are best that you you yourself like that your yeah. fa- own favourite things are often uh, are very, well, especially for you, but a very niche thing that no one else. Yeah. Even, no, well, you know, you'll have a favourite sitcom or a favourite band or a favourite piece of music that isn't yeah. necessarily anyone else's favourite piece of music, and so that yeah, that makes that you know. So how do you? Just, it's it's yeah. it's sort of ridiculous well, to no, try and compare one thing to another. But yeah. I also feel talking to the people in this podcast where I have had some very sort of. Uh, high status guests who are doing very well. There's a lot of very intelligent people passing their time doing really stupid things for <laughs> wasting their lives doing... Stu- and like with comedy, in 30 years' time, anything you're doing, apart from this podcast, will have disappeared. Yeah. And this podcast, out of the context of everything we're talking about, will be really odd. Well, I think the only thing that will survive <laughs> of my career is the recording I was invited to make by the musicians Steve Beresford and Tanya Chen of John Cage's Indeterminacy, which is available for £10 on the way. 
Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Good work. That was a, 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 a Lee and Herring catchphrase I got in there as well. Nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not, not as fondly remembered because it got, ta- got taken by uh, the fast show, did it, and did better. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's different, though, isn't it? Right. Nice. I was nice. Actually, that's a funny thought. When we were in the mid 90s, when we were doing, when we were doing the pilot of Fist of Fun at BBC Two, the pilot of um, the fast show was also being shot. And with, that, with no word of a lie, the perception in the building was that it was this terrible thing full of unrelated characters that was incredibly repetitive and why they spent this money and it would never catch on. And obviously, you know, it did. And, <laughs> I, told, uh, I had Charlie Hickson on the other week and I told yeah. him about how delighted our producer was that it wasn't working and uh, yeah. how we thought I know, we'd won. Yeah. Didn't, we didn't win. No. <laughs> <laughs> but at least Fist of Fun is available on DVD yeah. because we bought it ourselves and put yeah. it out. We and there's no it, higher We bought, accolade we bought than it that. back from the BBC for two thirds of what we were paid to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's just like the debt's paid in full, isn't it? <laughs> there's only our debt, it cost them more to make yeah, it, though, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They only blew a couple of million on it. So no, they didn't. They get 25% of every one we sell. Now. Yeah. So it's at least a couple of hundred quid for them. All right, well, you know, we might... It's been very uh, laid back. I can't even remember what time we started, but it's probably about time we finished. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to do the competition this week, because, you know... Yeah. Can I, I ask you something? Yeah. What are you going to do next? <laughs> After talking cough, what are you going to do next? I don't know. I can't see. Okay, all right then. Has um, well, you you know when you started doing your solo shows, yeah. say ten years ago, you were a young man. <laughs> I was. I know. Relatively. Yeah. Now you're old. I you're am. married. How has uh, I know? Yeah. How has the stability that that creates in life changed your? approach to generating material and reporting I've on only your been own. married for three months I know uh, but <laughs> um, I think it's I think it, well I think I've been with uh, my delightful wife Catherine who's a wonderful doesn't like being picked on she texted me in the interval to say don't pick on me and I'm not doing that I'm saying you're wonderful um, <laughs> is uh, uh, you know that's the last four you know we've been together for four years and I think in those four years I've done my you know I've, that's kind of given me a you know, a stability that I think the shows I was doing before then were kind of a bit wild yeah. and odd. Uh, and so I think that's helped me to have... The thing is, I was really, when I started comedy, I just wanted to get off with girls, and I thought it was a good way to meet girls. And uh, I thought I wanted to be famous so I could meet girls and get off with girls. But now I've got, I've got a wife, so I can't do that anymore, so I've just got to concentrate on working. <laughs> so that's... So anyway, God, without... I wonder why it will throw up. <laughs> there you go. So I'm, I'm working a lot. You've only just was... begun in many ways. I have, yeah. And also, a lot of your best work was generated whilst you were living in Shepherd's Bush. Yeah. It's a very exciting metropolitan yeah. place, isn't it? Full of all different exciting uh, experiences. Yeah. But the last few months, you've been living in... Yeah, Harpenden. In Harpenden. <laughs> Do you feel that you're now a Harpenden comedian? <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel... I, I tell you, it's quite interesting. Because when yeah. I write my blog... Uh, I've, in the last few years, it's, there was a point about seven or eight years ago where I thought I can't think of anything to write and I would really struggle. And then I completely got over that. I just thought I'll just write about anything that happens and yeah. see if I can make it funny. Since I've lived in Harpen, there's been about five, probably about seven or eight days where I've just gone, nothing is happening. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually nothing to write about. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm coming back from Harpenden. Okay, so do you Shepherd's feel Bush, that so like, you have right. to stay? in quite a difficult place to generate material. I think it's good. You know, the great thing about London is just stuff happens all the time. Yeah, so yeah. When, you write, when you write about minutiae, which is really... Good, that, that, well, I've done that through the blog, and that's then bled into the, the yeah. stand-up I do, because I wasn't doing stand-up when I started writing the yeah, blog. Yeah, and then, yeah. So when you're really looking for little funny things to do, to write about, uh, when you're in London, something, you'll, something will happen yeah, most that's days. Yeah, that's why I'm worried about, you know, getting older, having kids, and thinking, yeah. oh, maybe I should go. Because actually, I think the struggle of living in London and all the different kinds of people bump up against... And they have fact nothing works, and everything takes ages. Yeah. And, and all the like, you know, systems you have to deal with are broken down. It actually creates this feeling of frustration and irritation in you that actually leads to comedy. Yes, it's true. And if I were to live in Harpenden yeah. and have a much more pleasant life... I'd Someone kicked in uh, the glass in the front of our, the flats we live in the weekend. Yeah. Didn't write about it, though, I forgot. <laughs> 
that was it was <laughs> it was too exciting for half and I know I think it's true, but I think being ha- you know like people say with comedians you've got to be unhappy to be you know some yeah. journalists say it's only you're only funny when you're unhappy and not settled down. I, d- I think I'm funnier now. I'm, ha- I'm yeah, happy. Yeah, no, I think you are, but I don't think you were very good before. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I did. What? Um, another thing I'd like to say publicly. Yes. Is I think next time you tour. If you're doing venues of the size you're doing yeah. and you're carrying around all your merchandise and your scope bucket that you <laughs> yeah. take with you and doing all the driving, you need to get someone to... I've got, I've got a man. You need to get already. someone to go with you because I'm worried you're yeah. going to crash. <laughs> I might. I don't it's like my, when I wrote a blog about nearly yourself. crashing. I wrote a blog about nearly crashing my well, car I can't believe you've not... How much uh, is it? So my my mum got in touch and my, one of my friends' mums got in touch and you got in touch I to know, tell yeah. me. To tell me I had to have someone to do You've got to take someone with you. So you, you can't like be, my mum. At your age, you can't <laughs> yeah. be driving around the country with a big bucket of coppers for scope. <laughs> and uh, that he's got, he, he doesn't let it out of his hand either. So he's, <laughs> he's driving one handed with a plastic bucket of 1p <laughs> coins for scope. Can you imagine the tragedy that how awful the people from Scope would feel if they saw his head, his severed head rolling across with all the coppers collected for Scope in all this blood all over them? I genuinely They'd think wash them I've off got and use them, box, obviously. I've got those big boxes of programme in the back of the car, and I, exactly. I do often think, you know, it would be ironic if one of them were to, if it were to crash and one of them was just to smash me in the back of the skull. And well, it'd also be ironic if you, were to, <laughs> if, if, the, if you were to be run over by a big lorry and, yeah. and like. That you would end up in a in a pool of your own blood in a wreckage of your own car with loads of one peas for scope and torn up images of your own face. <laughs> so I think you need to find someone who's happy to spend time with you, uh, driving you and I, I helping like being you. Alone. Well, it's no good. Like actually, it's, it's you know you can't do. It. I had to get someone about three years ago. You're not you're too. No, I, but I, I actually think beyond, even with um, in terms of doing the show, you're too tired if you've driven if you've driven for well, you, five well, so hours. It's not like doing a twenty minute gig. You're doing like two hours yeah. now. I expect you need it's to hard work. See, it's hard work. It's hard work doing this. This one's been quite. I um, don't feel tired at the end of this one because it's been quite laid back, isn't it? But the other ones, I felt really. Like last week, the end of the David Baddiel one, I was kind of too. I was, was too like, tired to speak. It might have been he was just boring, but I was. I couldn't even. I couldn't be bothered to even finish a question. I started to ask him a question. I couldn't be bothered to finish yeah, answering. Yeah. That's been very interesting. You've got uh, three questions. Well, because well, th- we're not doing a competition, because you've all won, because you're here. <laughs> you got to see Lee and Herring back together again. It's not been as funny as you were hoping, has it? <laughs> it hasn't been as much ah, oh, not ah, oh, as you thought there'd be. Nat's chuff, and Nat's chuff. Well, you know, it's a uh, long it's time. Quite... It's like it's it's fourteen years since we <laughs> wrote anything, and um, and so it's we, you know it, it's uh, it's nice. It's nice. But we will do it nice again. I mean, I'm, I'm Richard's always saying every day he rings me up and he goes, "When are we getting?" <laughs> <laughs> but um, I actually think when people ask that, the, the logical answer is the problem is it is it's predicated on a um, on a teenage relationship, which we obviously no longer have. Right, which is to do with how we were when we were 18. The other reason is that I don't want to go around the country doing gigs and splitting the money like, <laughs> at my age when I'm trying to get... But the other, the other thing is, but I, I also think that the idea of bickering 20-something men is funny. The idea of bickering middle-aged men is just like, yeah, you would. But, when, but I remember when we were on tour a long time ago, we found a video in a pound shop... Uh, of a Glaswegian double act <laughs> of the 1950s that typically, in the way of Scottish musical acts, were huge in Glasgow, but 40 miles away in Edinburgh were despised <laughs> because the whole culture... Didn't even, I mean, Francie and Josie, and they got back together in their 80s and done this double act, which was clearly the act they used to do when they were young. And it was hilarious <laughs> seeing old men doing it. And one of the few things that I want to live for, apart from seeing my children grow up, <laughs> is to attempt to revive our routines, which, let's face it, were basically based around obscure pop culture references <laughs> of the early 90s. I'd like to do that in about 30 years' time. Iced tea, the cure, <laughs> Kinder Eggs, the Crazy Crocos. Think that for two men in their 80s to try and tour that material in the mid-21st century... <laughs> would possibly take on a veneer of surreal art that we could never have foreseen as uh, 
as the young man that wrote it. So we do look forward to that. And I hope that Rich, through the use of all the modern technology that I'm so suspicious of, <laughs> the internet, Twitter, the phone, and printing, uh, <laughs> will be able to maintain this audience that he will come. Uh, They'll all be dead. They're, 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 already, they're already dying. They're, they're already now. dying off our <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and so are we. Thank you. For, give a big round of applause <laughs> to Stuart Lee. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much for coming. We'll see you next week. Graham Lennon and I'm Andy Unici you next week. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Richard Herring's Left the Square Theatre podcast with my very special guest, Stuart Wee Lee. And it was produced by Ben Walker. He's all right, isn't he? The music was by Pest. Thanks to Orange Mark and everyone at the British Comedy Guide for getting this all together. Thank you to everyone at the Leicester Square Theatre. They're good too. It wouldn't be the same without them. Uh, This has been a Sky Potato and Fuzz Productions production production for the internet. How do you like them Sky (laughs) Potatoes? Thanks for listening to my podcast. It was fun, wasn't it? And uh, it is free. Uh, if you feel like you would like to give something back in return for these hours of entertainment, or uh, there's lots of things you can do. You can go to www.gofasterstripe.com to buy DVDs, including some of Stuart Lee's. Uh, and Fist of Fun is there. And Fist of Fun Series 2 will be up shortly uh, with this on video if you want to see that. So uh, that'll be in a couple of months, though. And What is Love Anyway is coming out there as well. But go and have a look. There's lots of things to buy there. My show, Talking Cock, is in preview and will be at the Edinburgh Fringe at the Udderbelly. Uh, Richard Herring's Edinburgh Fringe podcast will also be at the Stand One. You can buy tickets to that or listen to that for free as well. Uh, my producer, Ben Walker, produces Do the Right Thing on the 26th of June. They are at the Phoenix near Oxford Circus, uh, where the guests will be Katie Brand and Angelos uh, Epifimimu. Uh, Rod Hallenimu. Uh, so um, I knew I wouldn't get that in one take, but we'll use it anyway. You know, that guy off Shooting Stars, that guy. He's not even really called that, he's called Dan. Anyway, thanks for listening. Tune in next week. It will be Graham Linehan and Armando Hinucci, OBE. <laughs> <laughs>